Hi everybody and welcome to the Wild Ginger Running YouTube channel, live broadcast and subsequent podcast. Today we are talking to pro athlete Tom Evans. Hi Tom. Hey Claire, good morning, how are you? Good, thank you. Um, and you are running the Western States 100 mile endurance race in California in a couple of weeks time. And as well as sharing some of your really interesting training philosophies and mantras and advice for normal mid-pack, back-of-the-pack runners like us here today, we're also going to be chatting about Tom's latest exciting collaboration with Sun God Sunglasses because his signature series model, the Ultras, um, are coming out later this month and we actually have an exclusive competition to win a pair. So welcome, Tom. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. No, um, yeah, things are going really well. I've been in the US now for... Um, Three and a half weeks, training at yeah, Western State. So yeah, things are going things are going really well. It's a, yeah, it's always a bit terrifying. So when you look in your when you look in your calendar and you're like, oh, the races. People ask, oh, what are you racing next? Oh, Western State. But it's it's at the end of June. It's far away. But and I think it's the same with everyone. These races just creep up on you, and before you know it, geez, I've got one more long run. It's not even, it's not particularly long this weekend. And then, yeah, I then start tapering and yeah, all, all you can sort of, all I can really do now is mess it up. I can't get any fitter. <laughs> I can only um, throw everything away. So um, yeah. yeah, so that, that's been really fun. And yeah, I'm super excited about the, um, the signature series with Sun God. That's sort of been, yeah, a really fun process. Um, and yeah, it's been uh, yeah really excited to uh, yeah for people to understand a little bit more about them and sort of to yeah tell the story about how um, how the things come about and why they're not just for your elite runners uh, there. They've been designed specifically for everyone to be able to achieve their best, whether that's winning a race and setting a course record or it's just beating the cutoffs and finishing your first ultra whatever it is these are designed for you and sort of by wearing them by being part of the culture you buy into that yeah you buy into those aspects that it's the same it's the same community everyone's got the same goals yes they're going to be very different but everyone wants to achieve their goals and buy yeah that's sort of the, the whole idea behind it Awesome. Well, I will definitely be wearing these on my next ultra, which is hopefully going to be the Lakeland 50 in July. And I'm sure you'll be wearing them on the Western States as well. Um, but um, and I'll ask you some more questions about these in a sec. Well, at the, towards the end, because I'm really interested in the how involved you are in the design. Um, but first of all, just for people who um, they might be new to trail and ultra running, they've not come across you before. Um, uh, it appears you blasted to the top in a pretty meteoric rise in the last few years, but you've, um, just a little bit of your history, you've always been really energetic, haven't you? What was your journey um, in a nutshell? Yeah, so I, I'm 31 years old now. Um, I was at school in Sussex um, on the south coast. And when, yeah, when I was at school, I was always, yeah, I was always really sporty. Um, and then whatever the, school term was I would play that sport and I definitely wouldn't be the best but I would definitely try the hardest with everything um and I probably ended up looking better than I was at the sport because <laughs> I would get to the last five ten minutes of the game and I would have more energy than everyone else and I would score the winning goal or make a try saving tackle or whatever it was on the sports pitch it would make me look far better than I actually was. I just had a bigger engine and didn't get as tired as everyone else. And raced, and then in the in the summer I would do athletics and I would always race what was the longest. And I would sort of go to an athletics meet and I would race uh, 800 meters, 1500 meters, 2000 meters steeple chase all in an afternoon. And I would sort of just progressively get better and better as the day went on. But yeah, I didn't really think too much about it. Um, and raced cross country as well, and cross country is probably where I was, yeah, where I was at my best and would always perform. There'd be people who might beat me on the track, but I would beat them in cross country. Um, and then, yeah, after my A levels when I was 18, I went to the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst um, and commissioned into the Welsh Guards. 
and the Welsh being the Welsh, so the one of the, the cultural things that's really important to them is sport and team sport, and the military is all about being a team. So I, yeah, I sort of went back to more team sports um, and played lots of rugby. Played rugby for, yeah, for the Welsh Guards. Um, and we ended up actually winning the Army Rugby Premiership final, um, which was seriously cool and amazing to be involved in. Um, but again, I looked far better than I was because I just had a good engine and I was a bit faster than everyone else um, and could go for a bit longer and. I guess I then got to the stage in my career in the military where I couldn't turn up to work on a Monday morning with a black eye. Um, and yeah, the jobs that I was, I was doing, yeah, I needed to be, yeah, I needed to be at my best and I couldn't, I didn't want to risk getting a, a serious sort of blunt trauma injury through playing rugby, ACL, whatever it is, which is, yeah, fairly common. Um, so yeah, so I, I had always been interested in endurance sports um, and I've always been a bit of a sports science geek. Um, so yeah, so I sort of flipped my hand to, yeah, to more endurance advisors things and always just wanted to find the hardest thing to do and to set myself a challenge to do it. So I did the first triathlon I ever did was an Ironman. Um, <laughs> yeah, on an old road bike and I had I'd done the basket loads. on the front. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So the, sit up and beg bike but uh yeah I'd done I'd done next to no training before it but I was fit and it wasn't I didn't have any structured training but I really enjoyed and I enjoyed the challenge and in that race sort of, yeah I got better as the day went on and the run was the bit that sort of really appealed to me and I then had some friends in the military who did marathon to Saab in uh 2016 um and they did really well they sort of finished in the top 300 and and the Marathon de Saab, for those who don't know, is a 255-ish kilometer multi-stage self-supported race across part of the Sahara Desert in Morocco. Um, so you're carrying everything that you need. You get replenished water and you don't have to carry a tent, but you're carrying all of your food for the whole week. Um, and, yeah, well, I guess what it... Um, I didn't have a training program. I didn't have a coach leading up to it. I sort of did everything myself. Um, and yeah, fast forward 12 months. Um, yeah, I ended up racing Marathon de Saab and yeah, just had the most incredible experience. Absolutely loved it. Completely fell in love with the sport. Did far better than I think anyone ever thought that I was going to. Um, as I was a complete unknown, no I. Rightly so, I think I'd done one trail race before. Um, and, but yeah, I absolutely loved it. And after, yeah, my managed to sneak onto the podium at Marathon de Saab. And after that, I had some great opportunities, being invited to some other races, um, sort of mostly in Europe, um, as a part of the Ultra Trail World Tour at the time. And, um, yeah, had a really good year and finished, finished third overall in the ultra running um, sort of World Series, um, and yeah, that then sort of led me into 2018. That yeah, had a had a fantastic year. Sort of ended up yeah, winning quite a few races, breaking some course records, um, and yeah, and at that point, sort of decided yeah, in August 2018, to right, it's now um, I need to fully commit to this and see what I can do in the sport, and was incredibly lucky to have the opportunity to be able to turn full time and the army were great in allowing me to to go off but I sort of felt that I owed it to myself in order to yeah try and get the very best out of myself to um to turn full time. So yeah almost in twenty nineteen, almost to the day, um I was sort of officially out of the military and um yeah full time athlete. Amazing. And that's it's quite nice that you've ended there at 2019 because I know that you did the Western States for the first time in 2019, and this is your second go now. Um, so I've, I've been stalking you a little bit on Strava, Tom, and I know that yesterday you did a 20-mile uphill tempo run, which sounds exciting. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about where you are at the moment? Yeah. So, yes, I did. Um, 
I did Western States in 2019 and it went it went really well, but it could have gone better. And my training before wasn't great. Um, I like training at altitude and the Western States, it starts at altitude and it then gets very hot. Um, so I wanted to try and replicate similar sorts of terrain for that. And in 2019, I went to Ethiopia. That was good, but there was just not enough support. Um, I picked up a few niggles and just couldn't get them sorted. Um, so I am now in Flagstaff in Arizona, which is a three hour drive north of Phoenix, so halfway between Phoenix and the Grand Canyon. Um, we're at 2,250 meters above sea level. Um, and actually living with uh, two other professional athletes who both also run for Adidas Terex, um, which is, yeah, it was just been absolutely brilliant. Um, and yeah, so we are, yeah, just outside, yeah, just outside Dykestaff. I, at the end of the garden is the trail access. Amazing. So it's, yeah, I don't have to, I'll do the vast majority of my runs. I don't touch tarmac, which is just insane. Whereas I think a lot of, certainly in the UK, it's very, very rare that you can do that because there's there's just not the real estate. If you do a 20 mile run, even you park your car in a car park and you're on tarmac for a little bit. Whereas here it's, yeah, I'm on dirt from, from the very beginning. So no, it's been, yeah, it's been amazing, and yeah, training has been going really well. And I think the nice thing here is there are just so many different options of places to train, and you can you can end up getting as as specific as you want for the Western States course, which is what I'm doing, or any other races because yeah, there's just so much real estate. So yeah, drop down to Phoenix a couple of times to run in the heat, and it's sort of around 38 to uh, 40 degrees down there. Um, <laughs> Yeah, which is which is hot, but that's what it was going to be like at Western States. Yeah. Um, and then up here, it's it's not it's the perfect temperature for training. Um, but you're at altitude, um, so it makes it a little bit harder. So that's another great thing to be able to do. And then yeah, it's then very easy also to get into to run into the Grand Canyon, um, which is yeah, it's not that specific to Western States, but it's but it's just gorgeous. A descent though, yeah. and flat. <laughs> And then, and in a sense, yeah, and it's just absolutely beautiful and it's super hot. So it's, yeah, in some ways it's, it's amazing. It's very, very tiring, but no, it's brilliant. So yeah, I've been here for, yeah, three and a little bit weeks now. And yeah, another, uh, it's what day today, Thursday today. Yeah, so just yeah, two weeks. <laughs> two weeks and two days. Yeah. So yeah, I'm like stuff for, yeah, just under two weeks. And then I'll head over to, um, in California and um and go yeah, for the race. yeah and um yeah I saw some really nice pictures of you on your Instagram um uh running down into the Grand Canyon it just looks absolutely stunning um but I'm just wondering about the logistics of the travel how does it work because you've obviously got um your two dogs at home you've got your amazing wife pro triathlete Sophie Coleswell now Evans because you got married last year um how does it work like balancing your race schedules with her as a pro triathlete as well as you like do you ever get to travel together and experience this together or can you ever train together at home or can you ever do you like incorporate training with your dogs how, how does it work for you with the yeah, logistics great question um <laughs> sometimes it is really difficult um sometimes it's a little bit easier um depending on what our race calendars are we are very fortunate that we have got an amazing group of friends and family who support us whenever we ask um so whether it's if we're both away then Soap's mum will come and live at our house and she'll look after the dogs and and the chickens we can't forget the oh yeah the chickens, chickens too <laughs> um, yeah we have, uh, eat we have all seven the eggs chickens. for you <laughs> somebody's yeah, asked seven if, somebody's asked if you're vegan so you're obviously not vegan <laughs> no no um the majority I'd say our diet is based off, the majority is plants, but we also eat organic meat and free range eggs. Yeah. Um, and 
yeah, so we, um, yeah, we're very fortunate that, yeah, we've got this group that who can, who can help support us. And the vast majority of our travel and racing we do on our own, just because it, it makes life just a little bit easier to do because otherwise, yeah, you end up just being like a little bit of a spare part. And the majority of the times that Sophie's, that Soph's racing, she is, is in a city um, and she's not there for that long. So by the time I've got there, set up training and then watched her race and then come back, it makes it a little bit more difficult. So normally what I do, um, I'll, if I'm around, I'll go and watch the race. Oh, thank you very much. I had a coffee delivered to me by one of the best trail runners in the world. Amazing. Um, <laughs> um, and yeah, I, so I, when we can, we'll go and watch each other's races. So Soph came to um, to Chamonix and watched me at UTMB last year. Um, and then this year, post-Western State, I'll sort of follow her around and help out at her races. Um, I guess it's a little bit different for her being involved so heavily with British Triathlon, who do the most incredible job of all of the logistics and organisation. So the athletes almost just have to rock up and Whereas with trail running, because there's no governing body, yes, I'm part of the team. It's very much I can do kind of what I want. So yeah, it's it's really really nice. And yeah, when we're at home, I'd say we probably train with each other three four times a week. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, which is really nice. A bit of yeah, running and cycling. Um, got two dogs. We'll run with us, and the other one she just run away from us. Um, I was going to say, can the dogs to... keep up with you? But <laughs> dogs are always fast, aren't they? Yeah, uh, well, uh, yeah we've got two rescue dogs, um, one from Romania and another from the UK. And the rescue from the UK, he is a, um, a Spanish Spaniel Labrador cross um, and is the he's the perfect running dog. Um, up to 80... 80 to 90 minutes in cool weather, he's brilliant. Um, anything more than that, it's a, it's a little bit too much. So, yeah, it's just so nice to have a little bit of company. And I think sort of the thing that a lot of people say is you go out, you have a bad, you go on a run on your own, you have a bad session or things don't go to plan and you come home and the dogs are just so excited to see you. Um, so, yeah, it's it's really humanise, I guess, sort of, yes, we're both, Professional athletes and we're both very professional in the way that we approach things. But I'd say the one thing that I think we do is either of our training particularly better than anyone else's no. But I think what we do in our spare time to and to get separation from the sport, I think is really important because it keeps you fresh, it keeps you motivated. When you then, when I then have to come out here for, oh, what I say, when I have to, when I want to come out here for a month and have really good training, it's far easier to focus and to say, cool, it was an eight hour time difference back to the UK. I might speak to you for 30 minutes a day, whereas we're used to living with each other and being with each other for 22 hours of the day. And it's a pretty big jump because you go from being with each other 24 seven to, speaking with each other for 30 minutes a day, but I'll be out there for just under six weeks. So it, it is a it is a real shift and it is it can be really difficult. But yeah, I think when we're when we're together at home or when we've got the ability to be able to go to each other's races, we make the effort to do it. Um, and yeah, so races on the same day as I do. Um, and in Canada, that will make um, time difference way better for the final week out here and then yeah, I'm then not 100% sure what I'm going to do post-Western States, but um, yeah, my training, I'll look like a triathlete for at least a couple of weeks anyway, minus the swimming. <laughs> awesome. And um, and you live in Loughborough, don't you? I'm just wondering how you train for such mountainous terrain in Loughborough, um, or do you mainly travel elsewhere? Um, yeah, good question. When, when Soph and I sort of decided that we wanted to be together and as she's very much part of the British triathlon um, set up there were two options it was either Leeds or Loughborough um, and she's been in Loughborough for the last 
15 years. So it was a very, it was a very easy decision to make. Um, and yeah, luck was, for me, luck was the, it's the perfect base for training. Yes, there's not big mountains, but you can get, you can get enough climbing. Um, sometimes you would have think slightly outside the box. And so I guess I describe it as I would much rather have a really nice, mile run from the door that's my standard run or a 15 mile run from the door that's the standard rather than having the most incredible place to do long runs but actually your easy runs are really hard to do because there's not the terrain or it's just a bit more difficult to do because it's so steep so actually being in Loughborough is brilliant because I can do all of my foundation work at home, um, I use the treadmill a lot as well. Um, and we actually had a, a custom treadmill done from Woodway. Um, so the incline can go up higher. Um, there are lots of incline treadmills on the market, but uh, the one that we had, we broke because we were just working it too hard, whereas the Woodway is almost indestructible. Um, and yeah, I did a lot on Zwift. Um, yeah, I, find, yeah, I find that brilliant. The great thing about it is that you so I could be in, I can be in Snowden, I can be in the Peak District in Seven. Yeah, it's just, it's just super easy, and we, yeah, we invested in a, um, in a camper van uh, earlier this year, and that's just been a complete game changer to allow me to able to go to the beach for two days or the Reckon Beacons or Snowden or the Lake District, um, you know, to be able to train while still spending the vast majority of the time at home because, yeah, getting that thing for me is super important and it will, yeah, it will keep me in the, I'll be able to be more consistent, more, more which I think is, yeah, is, as in, if people know from endurance, the longer you do it, the better it just makes life enjoyable and you can train so much better. And I then, uh, to, on training camps, to do a really specific block of training um, where I don't really need to worry about sort of the fitness adaptations about sort of increasing my efficiency or my economy because all of that work is already done. So I can come out here and sort of really focus on the specificity of the requirements from the Western States course. So the heat, the altitude, um, there aren't the longest climb that Western States is a long climb at the beginning, which is fairly similar to the Peak District of distance and time wise. Yes, it's an altitude. But then after that, the next longest climb is a 25 to 30 minute run uphill which is my daily bread and butter um so it's yeah for, i think yeah Loughborough is brilliant to train for this is it ideal to train for something like utmb no but you can think outside the box and utmb is far less about fitness and far more about mentality um and if you believe that you're in a good place you, how do you train to run a 20 hour race? You can't, it's almost impossible because you can't, you can't train that specifically because you can't run for that long during the week. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, Loughborough is a brilliant, a brilliant place and yeah, I wouldn't change it for the world. Awesome. Um, that's quite near me actually. I think you're only about an hour away. Um, I did some heat running on a treadmill once to test various different clothes um, for a feature about the MDS. So um, yeah, yeah. it's interesting running in their heat room there and they've got access to so many resources. It sounds brilliant. And, and it's, but yeah, I did, before coming out here, we did a, I did a heat block at Loughborough University and they were, yeah, they were amazing. So it meant that when I came out here, excuse the pun, so I could hit the ground running and I was already ready for the heat. So now, yeah, I'm finding running in the heat here far easier than I ever have done before. And yeah, heat's a funny one. It's very it's quick to get the adaptations, but it's then very quick to lose the adaptations as well. So once you've built it up, you just need to, to trickle feed a little bit of heat every couple of days. 
Um, and yeah, I've been using using the sauna for that, um, and then just running in the heat as well. So yeah, it's been yeah, it's been great. Yeah, awesome. So so with your training for Western States, you you raced it four years ago, and I just can't believe that was your first hundred miler. Like you broke fifteen hours, you came third on one of the USA's premier courses. Like that's some first hundred miler, isn't it? A lot of us here will just be aiming to just finish a hundred miler if we ever even do one, let alone podium. So um, thinking back, what do you think made you successful on your first hundred miler? Was it like your mindset, your training, like pacing, nutrition, gear crew? There's so many things, isn't there? Is there like one thing that made you successful on that first time or did you just totally wing it? I think I definitely didn't wing it. I think the nice thing about trail running is there are so many different elements to it. You can have lots of things can go wrong for you to still be able to have a good race. But like, yes, there are some key headers. Nutrition is obviously incredibly important, but no one's ever gonna get a nutritional strategy 100% perfect. You can try, and the closer you get to perfection, the better you'll perform, but things are gonna go wrong. Um, and I think I definitely went into the, re well, Western States itself is, it's the original, 100 mile foot race and I guess I really bought into the story and the history of the race and for me that's yeah that draws me to a lot of races and I always wanted yeah Western State to be my to be my debut at the 100 mile distance and geez, I've only raced 200 milers um and yeah and it's things go right things go wrong and I think you need to optimize when things go right and try and keep things that things up going wrong and bring it back to what your plan is. So yeah, why did, I guess sort of why did it why did it go well? Like I think yeah I invested a lot of time, energy and resources into into being there and yeah it, it meant a lot to me. So yeah I think mentality was definitely I was mentally way better prepared than I was physically. Um, I was actually looking back at my training, like I think I averaged in the 12 weeks before Western States in 2019, I think I averaged like 75 miles a week, which it seems like a lot, but it's really not. Whereas I look back on this year and this year since the 1st of January, which is this year, um, it's typically when a year starts, <laughs> until now, um, I've averaged 122 miles a week, wow. every single week. Gotcha. And some, weeks bigger, some weeks are bigger than others, um, but it's just a completely different, I'm just in a completely different physical place. Does that mean the race is going to go twice as well? No, it definitely doesn't. Um, but yeah, the training wasn't the training then wasn't brilliant, and I would say now this is touch wood with still a little bit more time to go. This has been the most consistent I've ever been. Um, yeah, working with working with my coach Scott Johnson, um, and yeah, working with a couple of different sports physiologists to really try and optimize things. Um, yeah, has made a yeah has made a huge huge difference, and I guess yeah, haven't been afraid to to test some things in training to like the uphill tempo yesterday I've never really done them before and I guess sort of without going too much into the training for the last couple of weeks I've been doing uphill then downhill tempos whereas actually what we found is the uphill tempo is really good aerobically and it gets your heart and your lungs working whereas the downhill tempo just wrecks your legs and it's really good for training your quads but it's it takes a while to recover from. So this week we remove that from the training because that right, well, we don't need to. The training's been done. You can and to be able to have that confidence, be able to look back at training and think, oh actually, last week I did two by a mile downhill and I ran four twenty three a mile on a trail downhill, which I've never done before. Um, and yeah, it's better to do that and have the confidence to be able to say the work's done. The haze in the barn, just relax, stay healthy, stay injury free. Um, 
and yeah, so it's been um yeah, this has been a very, very different block, which I guess sort of ends up putting a little bit more pressure. I end up putting a bit more pressure on myself because I know how good the training's been. And I can still mess it up by going too hard because I think that I've my training's been really good. Or it gives me that confidence to be able to sit back and think, right, well, in these races and in sort of my whole career of running in sport, I perform far better in the I perform my best in the final quarter of a race or a game to actually be confident, have, yeah, be confident and be patient to be able to say, okay, let's get to 70, 75 miles and then let's see what's in the tank. Um, so yeah, no, I'm super, super excited about, yeah, super going back prepared. to, going back to Western States. It's a very different, very, very different atmosphere racing in the US compared to the UK, which I definitely think there is a big culture shock and I think it's why the Americans are typically done better at American races and Europeans are typically done better at European races. I don't think it's because the terrain. I think it's because the mentality and approaching the races. Oh, that's like interesting. Here, aid stations exist here, but it's your you're moving through them all. Like you don't really stop. Whereas at UTMB, I think I spent 12 minutes in total in aid stations. Whereas here, I think I spent three minutes. Which is really, but also the the wording um, of how everything is. The Americans are all very encouraging and positive and you'll be running on the trails. And even in training, there'll be people shouting, oh man, you look great, way to go, this is amazing, this is awesome. Whereas in Europe, people just scream at you saying, keep going, push harder, go, go, keep climbing as hard as you can. <laughs> Whereas in the US, it's much more mellow and it's, even if you look and feel horrendous, it's, yeah. come on, keep working, it's amazing. Yeah. So yeah, I... Uh, I I've, yeah, very quickly becoming, um, yeah, becoming more and more American. Um, yeah. I've, I've listened to lots of country music as well. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, feeling very, buying into the culture, which I think you've got to do. Definitely, definitely. That sounds really amazing. I think I like the American approach. <laughs> definitely one for it's encouragement. <laughs> um, so we've got um, a question from Sean O'Keefe, who's one of my patrons. Um, he says, I'm so excited for this chat with Tom. What he did at Ultra Trail Snowdonia was crazy <clears> good. <throat> What is his plan for the crazy underfoot conditions at Western States 100 this year? Now, I'm not sure what he quite means by that. I don't know if he's talking about the snow. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you, are you so, aware of these crazy conditions? <laughs> yes. Um, it's like it's going to be a race of two halves. Um, the first 30 miles will probably be very snowy. And then the... And by it will probably start to be quite warm and snowy. And it's very easy to get sunburned when you're running on snow um, because it'd be quite warm. So, and then the next stage, I guess the race is snowy first, third. There were really bad fires and floods on the course. So where a lot of forests that used to be off the and was much cooler. So it's so exposed. So absorbing the water's just running off the top because the roots aren't absorbing it. So and now because there's no trail just completely bake and it's gonna be super hard and really hot. And then the third and final phase of the race is back to normal and there's a bit more shade and it'll be a bit cooler. So, yeah, I guess the strategy for that, um, I've got two, possibly three pairs of shoes um, that I'll wear in the race. Um, yeah, all Adidas uh, Terex. Um, the first pair have been modified and have sort of got a really big, really aggressive outsole, very similar to a bell running shoe. Um, but with still with lots of cushion, it's it's the most specific shoe that I've ever 
worn. It's been designed for 50 miles on the Western States course through snow. Um, still loads of bounce. And normally if you've got a, a soft ground shoe, it would typically have far less um, stack height in the midsole because it makes it a bit more unstable. So we worked really hard to, yeah, to produce this, to sort of make this very individualized shoe. Um, oh, sorry to interrupt you, Tom. Was that the shoe that you were testing at the UTS? Um, there was a, no, you were wearing uh, a prototype shoe there. That's uh, very, very similar, but ever so slightly different. Um, yeah, very similar, but slightly different. Um, to the un to the untrained eye, it's exactly the same. <laughs> is is kind of all I'm allowed to say at the moment. Okay, but, um, no problems. <laughs> yeah, keep keep your eyes peeled. Um, Amazing. Yeah, it's keep exciting. your eyes peeled. I think they're being yeah officially released around. Not I'm not saying when, but around sort of the end of there might be a big trail running event at the end of August. Maybe where somewhere. they're um, where they where they're going to be. Um, release and all the details will come out um yeah and then the third and final phase now then switch to a shoe the very 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 similar to that i wore at snowden for the middle section and then either depending on what the conditions are like and how my feet are feeling either stick in those shoes or switch to another pair of trail shoes or a pair of road shoes for the final 20 miles awesome. um, so there's a plan i think what people what what people forget about is the the relationship between your foot your sock, your insole, and the shoe itself. So what I have done in my insoles is I have taken my insoles, because a shoe, when someone asks me about a shoe, one of the first things are, oh, how much does it weigh? And that's a great question. When a shoe gets wet, which it's my feet at Western States can be wet for the majority of the race the weight goes out the window. So how can you try and reduce the weight and then reduce the amount of water? It's obviously very heavy. How can you reduce the amount of water that the shoe absorbs? So I have uh, got a tiny, tiny hole puncher and hole punch bits out of the insole. So it can't absorb, it doesn't really change the weight. It maybe it changes it by a gram, which is nothing. It's the wrapper of a gel, but what it does is it absorbs far less water um, because there's less material for it to be absorbed. So, yeah, doing that. Um, different socks have been trialing heaps and heaps and heaps of different socks to, sort of, to try and find the best sock that works in those conditions. Um, and, yeah, I've found some two, yeah, two different brands that work really well. Um, and so I'll probably have – I would definitely change – socks i've sort of got one the race on the run that i do on the weekend will be a, a bit of a dress rehearsal um out of going full kit um so you know there'll be no instagramming from the final my final long run because i'll be in my race kit which is yet to be announced um yeah the exact shoes i wear and i'll start by getting my feet wet and yeah running and um making sure that everything is perfectly optimized and then i can just relax for the for the final two weeks going into yeah, it's, so yeah, lots of hard work has gone in from both myself and the team at Adidas Terex to yeah create the right footwear for a such a unique race. Yeah, that's awesome. It's good to know about stuff in the pipeline as well. Thanks for the little heads up on that. Um, and just talking about your like your last long run, um, which you say isn't very long one. Um, I've got a question from Andrew Knox, who is actually your biggest fan, by the way. He's a massive fanboy. He actually he met you. Um, where did he meet you? Um, he met you at um, the Terex store in Munich last year when the team were over for the uh, cool. Spitz. Um, ultra trail so he says hi mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sure you remember him yeah <laughs> and um, so he wants to know about the longest run in your training cycle when prepping for a race like this so because he's been enjoying watching Camille Heron talk about how she limits her long training runs and she relies on overall yeah. volume so she reduces injury risk and isn't too tired for the next workout so Andrew wants to know uh, do you follow that same sort of principle yeah, fairly, fairly similar. My longest run, uh, I raced Black Canyons 100k in February, 
that's the longest run that I've done this year. Um, I then raced Ultra Trail Snowden, 55k. Um, I've done a few 55 mile runs, um, probably five or six, and that would have been the longest that I feel comfortable doing then being able to still train the day after. Um, yes, I guess very similar to Camille's approach. Four hours of running is kind of like... And the day after, and then the day after, and then the day after. Then the day after. Um, so if I, if I should just go, yeah, go through my training sort of distances um or actually time is probably a bit more useful um from last week for example um monday two and a half hours tuesday was five out two hours wednesday long run that was half hours in the grand canyon 34 miles um then on Thursday, I had a double recovery day, so hour of the morning. In the morning, for two hours, and an hour in the evening. Three and a half hours, and Sunday, three and a half hours. So a lot of 22 and a half hours of total running, 142 miles. Uh, Total. Um, so it was a big week, but nothing except for the five and a half hours. But I feel like if I'd done six and a half, seven hours, I wouldn't have been able to run for an hour 45, 15 miles the next day. Um, so, yeah, I think for me, yeah, consistency and the accumulation of fatigue is far more important than. Not being able to run for a couple of days after, especially for, uh, especially for a race like Western State. I think for you can get you can do some longer runs and inconsistent is still important. But I think you can do you can do twenty miles at Marathon Pay, twenty four miles with being of wet jet, and get really this hopefully somewhere between 14 and 15 hours uh, depending on the conditions you can't train for you can't run you can't go and do 10 hours of running every week um, we could uh, so you can maintain do little things uh, um, yeah, it's been a lot of things for the activation mobility um, and recovery just to make sure uh, and be so consistent with it yeah so little and often it sounds like is a good approach yeah and um and we've got another question about the actual race as well um from baz green um he's keen to know um how he's he's quite keen to know how you run your own race because i know you're quite well known for like your mantras and and your sayings um so um you've got um you like to run your own race um and not get caught up like in someone else's race um he wants to know how how what advice do you have for actually doing that because you can get really caught up can't you and especially in a long race like that when it's important to start slowly yeah oh for sure i think it's it's one of the most difficult things and i think sometimes it's a case of do as i say not as i do <laughs> um as it is very, it's very easy to get caught up running someone's race and i guess for me what i have got i've got an incredibly detailed spreadsheet of the times i'm expecting to get into um get into aid stations so I know how long it should take 
um, and what pace I should be running in between. I also guess this this training block has been far more specific and far more scientific than I've ever trained before. Um, and I should guess I've always been fairly scientific with it, but this training block has been, yeah, working so closely with some physiologists to really optimize and to actually figure out like I take nutrition, for example, like I know exactly how many carbohydrates I'm burning, working at the intensity needed, the intensity that I think is needed to win Western States. So I know exactly how I need to fuel. Um, and it's just eliminating any possible questions. And does that mean because I know what I need to do, does that mean I'm going to do it? No. Is that my goal to do it? Yes, but things change. Your stomach might turn south or it's, I find it's really difficult to consume uh, carbohydrate products when it's really hot um, because they're quite sweet and I sort of end up sort of getting, yeah, I sort of feel really sticky and I don't really like it. So we've come up with a, yeah, some, uh, some solutions to be able to still consume the same amount of carbohydrate when it's really hot um i'll go into more detail post race on that uh and uh, and if it if it's worked it's worked it'll be a big thing and if it hasn't worked it will sort of be um yeah put into the archives and maybe adjusted at some point in the future so yeah i think it's going into the race with the confidence knowing that one knowing i've done the race before and i've had a good result um and I still hold the fastest split for the last 25 miles in the race. Um, so I know that I can, I know that I can do that. And I guess running such a long distance, it's always a, ban a very delicate balancing act of, do you go a little bit faster at the beginning, knowing that you're going to slow down at the end, or do you go a little bit slower at the beginning, hoping that you're going to speed up or slow down the least at the end. Um, so yeah, I, very a very detailed approach and yeah i'll go into the start line knowing what knowing how long it's going to take me to get from checkpoint to checkpoint um i wear a heart rate monitor um so i can certainly for the first half i might end up taking it off in the second half and the norm the reason that i would do that is wear it in the first half is sort of intensity control and make sure that i'm not going over a certain heart rate or a certain effort Good idea. And then I'll then take my heart rate monitor off at halfway because all bets are off at that point. Yeah. Just leave it all out on the floor. Rather than how you think what your heart rate's doing because you're in a race. Um, yes, you want to beat yourself, but you also want to beat other people. So I think that's where, that's how sort of I use the data. Um, yeah, and especially sort of using, yeah, using my Garmin. Um, I'll use, I'll raise an Enduro too. Uh, and yeah, it, it's, the, it's the best way to do it. Really, the first half of the race, for intensity control, and to be able to let yourself go and actually just in the second half. Yeah, that's really good advice. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I, I am a big fan of your mantras and sayings, and also Andrew, um, who is your biggest fan, he loves your mantras as well. Um, his, one of his, two of his favourites are process, not outcome, and control the controllables. One of my favourite ones of yours is don't let the highs go to your head or the lows go to your heart. I think that's very useful for ultra running. Um, and yeah. so I think now would be a really good time to bring in Sun God and the Ultras sunglasses that you've created with them because they carry one of your favourite mantras, don't they? Um, which is endure and complete, um, which, yeah, do you want to just tell us a little bit about why, um, what that means and, and what your involvement was in this uh, design process? Yeah, so I guess I, I had been trialling some different, lots of different sunglasses in my, yeah, in my running career and 
just had never found, I found a lot of sporty sunglasses were far more tailored to the cycling market, um, which is a way bigger market because uh, typically people have got more money to spend on kit and equipment because you're buying a bike. So chuck in another hundred pounds and buy some sunglasses as well. Um, I think it's a little bit different. So I don't think brands were really focused on creating top product for runners. And I think runners just wore, some, wore cycling sunglasses. Um, and then, yeah, then started, yeah, started hearing a bit more about Sun God and tried a couple of glasses. And at the beginning, it was a, we actually had initial conversations in um, 2019. And I tried to, and at that time, they were only producing um, cycling sunglasses and said to them, look, you guys are doing a great love your lens here. I love the idea behind it, but at the moment it just doesn't work because you're not prepared. You're not making specific enough glasses for my needs. So some conversations finished and then in yeah, 20, 2021, when the idea for them of creating some actual running sunglasses came out and they came to me and said, look, this is what we want to do. How can we do it? Um, and yeah, so I guess I've worked with them from the stage on that and I was super excited about how passionate they were about creating this product really for running and for runners. Um, and I guess that then takes on reason. So they created the Ultras, which I've, yeah, I've been wearing for a couple of years now. I wore it all last year. I wore it at UTMB and I've worn it this year at Western States. Um, and yeah, and then the idea sort of came, let's do a, yeah, let's do a signature series Um and yeah, for me, it's, it's super important. Like, I think there's a lot of, there is a difference between professional runners and your average, your standard runners. So the, the shoes that I wear, for example, you can't buy, they're prototypes. Um, and I will probably keep racing in prototypes for the rest of my career because I will always be a year or so ahead of, production because that's how brands work so yes they might look the same and then previously they have been the same but they're still fundamentally a little bit different whereas for these glasses the glasses that i have now got on my head are the exact same ones that you have got that are the exact same ones that people can buy online so the glasses that i am wearing they could have been yours and the glasses that someone else might buy they could have been mine. So I think it's really nice that it's, it, is exact, it is exactly the same. Um, yeah, and I guess sort of where Endure and Compete came about, it was, yeah, it was wanting to create this, um, this idea, this feeling that your best is the best. And it doesn't matter whether you're trying to break course records or you're trying to finish a park run. That's the, yeah, the winner, hope maybe the winner of Western States will wear them and then someone who completes their first park run in the UK the weekend after. My mother-in-law might wear them. Some friends from school might wear them. Um, and for me, it's, it's by creating that mini community that actually... If you're wearing these, you know the mindset of the other person. They want to get the very, very best out of themselves. That doesn't mean that they're trying to win races, but they are trying to be the best version of themselves. And with that, you're sort of creating that tribe, that sort of allegiance, that team. And I love working in a team, and I've always sort of been very much sort of team-spirited. And, yeah, I want to create this team, and I want to create this atmosphere around a product that you put these glasses on, and you immediately join that team and you join that mindset and we're all sort of connected because we want to get the very very best out of ourselves um yeah it's called endure, endure and compete and no matter who you are what you're doing in order to get the best out of yourself you have to endure the very nature of endurance is yet to do something for a prolonged period of time and for an ultra runner that's what for me that's what work is that's what work and play is at the same time and you need to keep sticking at something in order to be able to achieve your very best and then the compete side of things is you're competing against yourself 
doesn't other people don't matter doesn't don't worry about what other people are doing but worry about you worry about competing against yourself to be the very 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 best version of yourself and if by competing against yourself becoming the best version of yourself for me i hope the best version of myself is good enough to be the best in the world and but if it's not that's great that's absolutely fine i'm who is my very best and using these glasses while creating this separate identity I want to be able to help people to be their very be- their very best versions of themselves um, and then you see someone else wearing these glasses and you know you know that they are also trying to do that um, there's a reason why someone has bought these and wants to wear them because they want to be part of that team part of that group where yeah they everyone knows that they want to get the very best out of themselves i think that's into today's today's world i think it's yeah it's pretty rare that you can sort of that's so yeah we're looking don't worry about what anyone else is doing worry about yourself um you put it on and you can you want yeah, photochromatic lenses or the lenses that I use are these ones, sort of um, blue and yeah, 8KO vision. It's by far the yeah, the best lenses that I've ever used. And the sort of way that I describe it is, yeah, I can see so much better and I can see so much clearer. There's so much differentiation on the trail. So yeah, it's super important. And um, yeah, they're they are just a standard pair of of ultras but with a yeah with a really cool unique design um yeah the splatter yeah, really, really cool close design. Hey. i love the colors and i love the splatter was it you who came up with the splatter design i think we wanted we want i didn't know exactly what what we wanted but i knew what the outcome wanted to be and yeah it was creating something super unique and playful but also relating to the trail at the same time. So the idea of the spatter actually came from, there's a picture from the last time I did Western States where I had just stepped into a puddle and the picture was from behind and the mud and the dirt had just gone on the back of my legs. And it was, yeah, sort of expect the unexpected. You're doing this, what you think is gonna be a really hot dry race and actually something happens and you're enduring and you're competing against yourself um and so yeah that's sort of where yeah where the idea came from the, yeah, the splatter of it is yeah representative of sort of the mud and the earth and the dirt sort of getting onto your body and sort of yeah creating this you're very much part of yeah part of the nature and and i think it then becomes really organic with sun god sort of being a b corp and their sustainability is, well, it's, it is, if not the best, it's one of the best. Um, and yeah, they recently became a B Corp um, last year, which is super exciting. Yeah, to be able to work so closely with a company that's giving so much back and yeah, is just, yeah, it's just absolutely incredible. Yeah, and they're built to last, aren't they? They've got a lifetime guarantee. Um, so yeah, I, if I break these, if I sit on these, like I did once, I went on a, a seesaw in a park just before the um, Low Alpine Mountain Marathon and sat on my sunglasses. So that will be very handy for me. <laughs> um, so we have actually got a competition to win uh, this very pair of sunglasses that you see now on my head. Um, so this is an exclusive opportunity to win um, these brand new unreleased sunglasses. They're worth worth 150 pounds and they obviously feature the award-winning zero bounce frame design and the market leading 8KO frameless lens technology that you were just talking about there Tom. Um, so they're designed to elevate your performance on the trails as you were talking about and joining that exclusive club where you um, know um, what the other person is doing trying to get the best out of themselves. So you will find a link in the film description below if you're listening to this on the podcast you'll find it in the show notes below so if you enter now now um put your, all your details in there and the winner will be drawn on the 8th of july so you can join the tom evans club everyone for free perfect amazing no i'm, I'm 
I'm very excited to see the yeah the first person out on the trails wearing um yeah wearing them. That'll be a, a very cool moment. Yeah, you'll have to give them a big high five. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Um, well, uh, I've just got one last question, Tom. If you are, um, if you've got time, it's a very short one. Perfect. Yeah, one did, more is great. Did I read somewhere that you're also thinking about having a crack at the Bob Graham Round record after Western States? Are you still on for that, or is that um, something yes. that's a bit too much this year? It's kind of it's kind of fifty fifty at the moment, um, depending on how yeah how things go at Western States. I'm not not fully deciding. Um, to either do it or not to do it, it's definitely in the. It's definitely a plan. Um, whether it's this year or subsequent year, it, I really want to do it, and I think for me, it's yeah, it's really important to do it. But when I do it, I don't want to rush into it. I want to make sure I do it exactly the right way, and fully. In, I'm able to invest enough time into doing it properly and giving it the respect that it deserves, rather than just rocking up, grabbing a team of paces and going. Um, so yeah, it's very dependent how Western States goes, how I recover. Um, there is a little bit of a plan as well to return back to UTMB this year, mm-hmm. um, which is why I did the Ultra Trail Snowden race. Um, to get your I still needed to. I still needed to get a yeah to get entry into UTMB, and I just needed to do any race um, and finish. So yeah, have I have I thought about doing the double of Western States UTMB? Yes. Um, have I thought about doing Western States then Bob Graham round? Yes. Have I thought about trying to do all three? Probably not. Um, and if I did, it would then be a winter Bob Graham round. Um, so yeah, it will um, all will have got. I've sort of yeah put all, put all of my eggs into one basket with Western States. And, uh, yeah. I will, I will see how I recover and, um, yeah, make my shop after that. Awesome. So everyone will just have to follow you on Instagram to find out what's happening. Um, <laughs> so thank you very, very much. Precisely. Tom. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Tom. It's, it's just really kind of you to share so much information and that we can translate into advice for our own selves doing these ultra runs. Um, so yeah, everybody follow Tom on Instagram to find out what he's doing next and find out how the Western States go- goes. Um, enter the Sun God competition to win the amazing ultras sunglasses the sunglasses and um we just all wish you the very best for western states and beyond tom thank you so much thank you very much